well, thank you very much, Don, for the introduction. And it is, uh, it is truly a pleasure and an honor for me to be here today uh, talking to this audience. I've had a chance through Don and Rosie to, to do a little bit of homework on who's going to be here. Um, and you're uh, clearly a very talented bunch, but I'm also told that you're a very talkative bunch. So I'm going to lead off my presentation with a few slides of background information. And, uh, but after that, please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, because that's what makes these presentations a lot more fun for me. I, I want to have a, a, as much of a dialogue as possible. Uh, I'm here today representing the XPRIZE Foundation, as Don said. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about us, but I want to start by telling you a little bit about prizes in general, uh, because although we are now sort of the most famous prize organization, uh, we are certainly not the first. Prizes have been around, around uh, well before any of us were ever born. Um, and in fact, our entire idea, our entire foundation is predicated on, or really copied from, uh, an earlier prize. Uh, so our prize is really copied from an earlier prize called the Orteg Prize. And as some of you may know, probably all of you know the name Charles Lindbergh, and could all say what Lindbergh did. He was the first person to fly, uh, thank you very much, first person to plot, fly a plane, a solo plane, nonstop, transatlantic of any distance. Some people had done a little puddle hop uh, from... Ireland over to Newfoundland or something like that, but he flew from New York City to Paris. Uh, and the reason he did it was to capture a prize. There was a gentleman uh, named Raymond Orteg, who you see right here, the short old gentleman, uh, who was a wealthy guy. He owned a bunch of hotels, and he just thought flying was cool and interesting and potentially commercially useful down the road. So what he did is he wrote a letter into the editor of one of the popular trade magazines of the day, a, a magazine for pilots and aviation enthusiasts. It was very simple, it was about two paragraphs long, and it essentially said, I'm offering a $25,000 prize to the per first person to fly nonstop from New York to Paris or Paris to New York, all other details as per your care. That's all the work he did. He said, I'm rich, I have this money, I think this, this is important, I'm putting the money out there, you do all the rest. Uh, and luckily for us, uh, all of the leading aviation experts of the day got excited by this, and they said, hey, that's an important goal, it's an extremely difficult goal, but we think it's achievable, and we think it's worth trying for. Uh, and so you had the most fa famous pilots and the most famous, famous aviation engineers of the day all looking at this prize. A lot of famous birds, some, uh, names some of which you may recognize there, like Admiral Byrd. And then you had this little guy, Charles Lindbergh, who at the time was a junior pilot on a mail route out of St. Louis. He was a nobody, no one had ever heard of him, had no reason to think uh, that he would ever do anything spectacular whatsoever. Uh, but thankfully, he was a smart guy, he was a friendly guy, and a perseverant guy. And he was able to go to his local community in the city of St. Louis and convince some local benefactors and bankers there that his crazy idea was worth a shot, and they gave him enough money to uh, put together a prize-winning effort. So he later wrote a book called The Spirit of St. Louis, which is actually a fantastic book. It's a Pulitzer Prize winner. I, I highly recommend reading it. It's pretty impressive that someone can write a book and make it entertaining when about half of the book is a discussion of this guy trying not to fall asleep at the wheel as he flies over the ocean. But, but somehow he makes that exciting and dramatic. Uh, but my boss, Peter Diamandis, was given this book in uh, the early 90s uh, because he was trying to become a pilot and he kept getting halfway through the lessons and sort of giving up because he ran out of time. And so a friend gave him this book as inspiration. And it was truly inspirational to him, but for a totally different reason. He started reading about this prize and reading about all the teams that were competing for it and doing math in the margins of the book, because that's just the kind of guy he is. And he realized that for this $25,000 prize that was put up by this wealthy hotel owner, uh, nine teams all together spent 16 times the prize value trying to win that prize, which is pretty darn impressive. I mean, that's a great leverage point. That's a great multiplier, especially when you consider that the only money that Raymond Orteg had to pay to offer this prize was the price of a postage stamp. Um, so his risk, if no one had won the prize, was he was going to be out that five cents or whatever postage cost in 1919. I don't know what it was. Uh, so that was exciting. But then he read further into the book, and after Lindbergh had success, successfully won, and there's a, a short sort of post log there, uh, and the numbers there were truly impressive. You see him here on the screen, but. The number of planes quadrupled, the number of pilots tripled, which I guess means that some percentage of those planes were flying themselves. Uh, but it, the especially exciting one was this last one there. The number of people buying commercial airline tickets and traveling as a passenger went up by a factor of 30 in eight months after Lindbergh's flight. 
Now, as a guy reading this book who desperately wanted to go to space and knew he had zero chance of being a NASA astronaut, that was what really excited him. He said, I want to go. I'm never going to go as a, as a civil servant. The only way I'm ever going to go is as a paying customer. So maybe if we can repeat this success somewhere down the road, I'll be able to buy a ticket and I'll go to space. Um, and so uh, that's, what it, that's what really inspired him. He started doing some research and realized that the Orteg Prize was not the first prize nor the only prize. There are lots of other ones uh, dating back uh, several hundreds of years to the Longitude Prize, which is what really allowed the creation of the British Armada and civilization uh, <laughs> evolved as we know it because of that prize. Also the Kramer Prize for nonstop flight across the Atlantic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and he created what is now called the Ansari X Prize. This was announced in 1996, and it was a $10 million prize for the first privately funded team from anywhere on the planet to build and fly a spacecraft capable of carrying three people above 100 kilometers twice within two weeks. Uh, and we saw shockingly similar numbers to the Ortega Prize. So 26 teams, uh, the majority from the US and other space-bearing countries, but a number from rather unusual places like Romania and Argentina that you don't necessarily associate with human spaceflight, uh, all doing work on their own dime, raising their own investment, zero risk to us, ultimately culminating in the flights of Spaceship One, three flights, uh, one in the summer, one in September, one in October of 2004. So um, you were all around at the time. I don't know how closely you were following. Hopefully you saw the headlines and, and watched a little bit of this. But I know I was sort of just coming into the space industry. I had been a planetary scientist and had sort of gone back to school to try and jump more into the vehicle side of the industry. Um, and I was actually was back in school getting my master's degree and three of my classmates were considering going to work for XPRIZE uh, in March of 2004. And what they were told by every single faculty member at the university was, it's a cute idea, but don't waste your time. The XPRIZE is nice, it's fun to talk about, but no one's ever gonna win. It's too bad. This was in March or April, something like that, of 2004. Two months, fortunately, my fellow students ignored this advice from their professors, as students so often do, took the job anyway, and two months later, were watching Spaceship One fly into space. This was a total paradigm change. No one had ever thought that a private company could do this, because everyone knew that the only people who go to space were NASA, Soviet Union, Russia, and a year before Spaceship One, China. And those were multi-billion dollar programs that involved standing armies of personnel, et cetera, et cetera. So this was really eye-opening uh, for people. What did this prize accomplish? Um, obviously, there were some technological advances. Anyone who's had a chance to go, uh, I think you all had a, you had a field trip to the Air and Space Museum, or is that coming up today, something like that? Right. Did you go to the Dulles one, or did you go downtown? OK, you went to Dulles. Well, if you, if you get a chance, if you're from here, or if you have uh, some time to stick around and you go to the downtown version of the Air and Space Museum, Spaceship One is hanging right there in the main foyer in the Milestones of Flight Hall, actually right next to Spirit of St. Louis, which is very uh, nice. And, sort of emblematic. Um, and if you look at that craft, there are clearly some technological advances that were associated with building it. Uh, a lot of composites material, the feathering of the wings, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the hybrid engine were new groundbreaking things. But that wasn't really what the prize was all about. It was, was about that, but it was also about these other things, regulatory reform. About a year before Spaceship One flew, it would have been illegal for Spaceship One to fly. Uh, there was simply no means by which a commercial agency could take a human being into space. And what this prize allowed the Federal Aviation Administration to do, much to their credit, was instead of looking backwards and regulating in hindsight, as regulatory agencies so often do, they were able to look forward and say, hey, we know this class of vehicles is coming. Let's be prepared so that when these operators come to us, we know what tests to put them through so that we can make sure they're safe without overly impeding their progress. Uh, and that was able to happen. It also brought a sense of legitimacy to the field of private manned spaceflight, which hadn't existed before, but especially to the individuals and teams and companies that wanted to compete for this. If you can imagine walking into an, a venture capitalist or a bank or anything like that in 1990 and saying, hey, uh, I'm just this guy with a, with a degree and I'm an auto mechanic and I want to build a rocket to carry people to space, you can imagine